So I'd like to move from the global world perspective down to the perspective of the single individual. And the take home lesson for this lecture is population health in the future is going to be executed one individual at a time. And you'll come to understand in more detail about that. So systems-driven thinking, and you've heard that in what Howie had to talk about, has, has really led to some interesting kinds of conclusions. And what exactly do we mean by systems kind of thinking? And this is just a, a long list of the essence of what it's about. It's holistic, it's global, it's integrative, it's dynamical, uh, and it's about a network view of how information is managed in living creatures. And fundamental to this is the idea that biology really is an informational science. And we need new technologies to open up new dimensions of patient data space. We need to be able to harness those technologies and high throughput platforms to generate the big data and its analytics we'll be talking about in this talk. I think it's critical that we use all the contemporary machines of uh, analytics, uh, uh, machine learning, AI, and all the rest. And, and finally, we have to remember systems thinking in biology is about biology. It isn't about calculations. It isn't about technology. It's driven by the biology, and always uh, it should be. So this systems thinking has led to um, three different interesting concepts about medicine. So the first is the idea if we take a systems approach to disease, we, we come up with a discipline called systems medicine. And it's about the realization that human beings are incredibly complex. And when you go to the doctor's office and maybe get 20 measurements and observations, it doesn't begin to be large enough to deal with the dimensionality of what we have. So we need something we've called personal, dense, dynamic data clouds that follow longitudinally the course of wellness and disease in each individual. We need the idea that networks uh, regulate the flow of information for development, for physiology, for aging, and when disease perturbed cause disease, so we can study disease in terms of disease perturbed networks. And it's important to generate the new technologies and the new systems driven strategies. The second point of view that uh, came forth is this uh, idea that healthcare should be predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And we've called that P4 healthcare. And it really is about two major thrusts in healthcare. One is wellness care, and the other is disease care. And of course, the contemporary 20th century medicine system focuses virtually entirely uh, on disease care. And of course, the final point of view is this really interesting idea that we have to actually analyze what wellness is so we can quantify and legitimate it, legitimize it in terms of uh, contemporary medicine. And in fact, uh, Nathan Price and I began to do that in 2014 when we uh, proposed a project of 108 friends that we would subject over a nine month period to uh, creating these personal dense dynamic data clouds to see what we could learn uh, about wellness. Putting in perspective, the determinants of health actually are threefold. One, genetics contributes 30%, two, environment lifestyle contributes 60%, and three, the healthcare system contributes just 10%. And of course, what's interesting is if your health is determined primarily by how your body integrates your genetics and your environment, then these personal dense dynamic data clouds are ideal ways to capture uh, those, that twofold 
uh, set of integration. So we started in, 19, uh, in 2014, then this pilot study I talked about. And it was interesting. I went to NIH and tried to persuade Francis Collins he should fund this. And he said, the role of NIH is to study disease. It's not to study wellness. So what we did, actually, was to create a data cloud which included the complete genome sequence. It took blood draws every three months so we could get clinical chemistries, metabolites, and proteins. Every three months, we uh, assayed the fetal microbiome to get the uh, quantitative assessment of species therein. And we used digital self with the Fitbit and other measurements to get uh, activity, sleep, uh, and other kind of measurements. And these went together to create this data cloud, which, if analyzed, led to actionable possibilities, which, if acted upon, could either increase wellness and or let one avoid disease. And what we did was every month had a wellness coach bring to the pioneers a subset of the actionable possibilities. And the coaches were absolutely critical, trained in psychology as well as in understanding the actionable possibilities. They could put these possibilities in the context of your own health objectives. And the coaches had three really important objectives. One, they educated the individuals about what it was to be well, and that's really important. Number two, they actually were able to uh, affect a remarkable compliance with regard to actionable possibilities of 70%. And then number three, they were critical to persuading many of the individuals to re-sign up. So we had uh, deep longitudinal data, as I'll talk about in just a few moments. Now, I think the most remarkable thing, and you'll hear all about this from Clayton Lewis when he gives the final um, keynote talk. I think the most remarkable thing from the individuals was the realization, although all 108 of them purported to be well, if you put them on a staircase of wellness, probably most of them would be near the bottom. All of them had a long list of actionable possibilities. And of course, it was the actionable possibilities that brought them up this ladder. And what we really aspire to is to bring people up to the point of the welderly of Eric Topol. Individuals in their 80s and 90s, never been sick a day in their life, never been in a hospital, never taken a drug, who go into the 90s mentally and physically alert and uh, capable. And that's what we aspire to do. And if we're to do it, then this uh, journey of wellness will become a lifetime journey. And that's the theme you'll hear reiterated later on. At the end of this study, Many of the pioneers wanted to go on, so we set up in mid-2015 a company called Aerofail to bring scientific wellness to uh, consumers. And I think there are two really remarkable things about uh, Aerofail. One is they already have almost 4,000 pioneers on which we've collected dense dynamic data clouds, some for almost three uh, three plus years now. And number two, what we're beginning to see already are transitions from wellness to disease for virtually every chronic disease. And the key point is we can use this to deal with chronic diseases in the future, and we'll come back to that in just a few moments. The data that we generated uh, really have been transformational in their view of human physiology, human uh, development, uh, human aging, and so forth, and of course, in some cases, in human disease. It's, it's like the Hubble telescope in the sense that it gave us a resolution of understanding that uh, was very parallel to what the Hubble telescope did for the heavens. We could look into biology and 
wellness and disease with a resolution that heretofore had been previously impossible. We published in August of uh, last year uh, a major paper on the data that came from the 108 pioneers that I'm going to go through in just a moment and talk about that and include uh, some of the data that, from the Aravel pioneers that have come uh, since. One of the unique relationships between Aravel and the Institute for Systems Biology is we work together on the data that comes from the pioneers to unravel the mysteries of uh, human biology uh, and human disease. So there are four major observations that we've made, and each of them open up incredible avenues of opportunity in wellness uh, and in disease. So the first is statistical correlations. And what we did with the initial population of 108 individuals was essentially a statistical analysis of how data bits in any one of the six different data types uh, were statistically significant, either in a positive or a negative sense, with data bits in any of the other five data types. And we saw about uh, 30, 3,600 uh, different kinds of correlations of these types. And I just want to make the point, the analyses I'm going to be talking about are static analyses looking at a population and how things correlate within a population at a point in time. The studies for the future that are really going to be interesting are the dynamic ones where we look at the populations at different time points and see how they've changed. For example, we've started to do that with 108 pioneers. And if we look at the beginning and at the end, we see remarkable statistical correlations that are quite different from the ones we see here that, at least in part, have to reflect the wellness that's come from the wellness regimen I've just described. So this, these statistical correlations look exactly like impossible hairball. And, and operationally, what we've done is to say, let's cut the edges that are of the lowest statistical probability. And when we do that, we see of the order of 70 discrete analyte domains, and those analyte domains correlate with physiology, with biology, with genetic predisposition to disease, and with biomarkers in absolutely fascinating ways. And these communities open up the ability to identify biomarkers and drug targets in absolutely orthogonal ways to anything that's ever been done before. For example, if we take a, one of the communities, and this is a cholesterol community and expand it out, we can see that it has a whole series of positive and negative relationships. So one is with vitamin E, which we've known about, Another is with uh, endogenous thyroxin, which turns out is a drug for type 2 diabetes in reducing LDL levels. What we've done with a number of other communities is found nine additional instances where there are interesting biomarker or drug targets, and we've been able to go to the literature and show those are being investigated by pharma and biotech companies at this point in time. We have hundreds of possibilities that are candidates unexplored for the future. So this opens up an enormous dynamical possibility. Number two, we can determine your genetic risk. And we've looked at it for roughly uh, 135 diseases or so by using what are called uh, GWAS markers, genome-wide association SNPs that uh, have been done, as you can see, in very large population studies, examples there in the hundreds of thousands of individuals. And each of these little markers contributes just a small amount to uh, the phenotype of the genome. And one of the big interesting paradoxes in human genetics is 
If you add these up in the initial studies that are done, they only account for a very small amount of the genetic risk. So where is the rest of the risk been hidden? The rest of the risk is in more markers. And the one place they've really looked at that in detail is in height. And they now have GWAS markers for heights that sum to more than 80% of the total genetic risk. So they're there. They're just there in very small. Uh, each of them contributes in a very small sense. So we can take the GWAS data and map it into the complete genome sequence in terms of probabilities and generate for each individual a relative risk. And then what we've done is look at of the order of 2,000 normal individuals and map them for each of these genetic traits. And often we get this more or less bell-shaped curve. And then what we can do is see where the individual maps. Is it on the low side, the high side, uh, or in the middle? So we can determine relative to their own orthogonal population what the relative risk is for each individual. And we can do it for all of the common diseases for which there is this GWAS data. Now, the other thing we can do that is really fascinating is we've mapped here the 108 individuals into five bins from very low genetic risk to very high genetic risk. And then we can ask, are there analytes of the 1,000 or so we've analyzed in that data cloud that correlate with genetic risk? And for LDL cholesterol, there is one. Uh, LDL cholesterol itself maps in a beautiful linear way. And so the interesting idea is LDL cholesterol maps into cardiovascular disease in an interesting way. If we could decrease the level of this, could we actually change the genetic risk of these individuals? And the fact is, we can decrease uh, LDL cholesterol with statins. And the fact is, in operational sense, we do change the genetic risk. But to show you how frequently this has happened, here is increasing genetic risk for inflammatory bowel disease. And what you see beautifully is a negative correlation of cysteine with that genetic risk. And it turns out cysteine is a critical precursor for glutathione, which plays a major role in reducing oxidative species forms that lead to uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So the interesting possibility is can we take these high genetic risk individuals and bring the cysteine up to normal and change their genetic risk? So that's something is testable. And it's true of virtually every disease we've looked at. So we may be able to ameliorate genetic risk with the manipulation of analytes that are biologically relevant to the disease that we're actually interested in. So uh, there are then two really important applications of polygenic risk scores. One is now we can take individuals and identify, for example, those at the highest risk, 5 to 10 percent, for Alzheimer's. And we can follow them with dense dynamic data clouds to see the earliest transition in those normal individuals when they move from wellness to disease. We'll talk more about that later. And of course, the second thing is we can look for the correlations of analytes and ask whether there are analytes whose concentrations can be manipulated uh, to change uh, genetic risk. One of the most spectacular things you saw with the uh, Airvale uh, uh, cadre is we've seen beautiful wellness to disease transitions for almost uh, all major kinds of chronic disease. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. So here's an individual that had very, very high white blood cell counts. Uh, he was, this was noted the very first time we, we did a blood draw. And his coach urged him to go to his doctor. And it took a couple of more sessions before he finally did go to his doctor and did get the uh, diagnosis of leukemia. But what we can do with patients like this, where we have blood draws 
way out preceding the final diagnosis down here, is take each of the 10,000 or so analytes and look at them one at a time in terms, this was in terms of a population of about 1,000 individuals. So these are all the numbers of individuals that have a certain protein, which is outlier for three individuals, statistically way off scale there. So this is the patient that uh, I've described, and the question is, is that a nice outlier mark for uh, chronic leukemia? And of course, the really interesting point is, will these two people come in time to get chronic leukemia? And hence, will this be an early pre-symptomatic marker that we can begin to think about how to manipulate in ways I'll discuss in just a moment. And exactly the same was true with a woman who in January of 1917, 57 years old, diagnosed with stage four uh, 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 chronic uh, uh, acute uh, uh, pancre pancreatic cancer, and that's really uh, a grim disease, and we had four blood draws before her, um, uh, before her diagnosis. And we did exactly the same for all of the analytes, 10,000 of them, and for one of them, a particular protein, which is a regulator of uh, neuroendocrine growth, which is specifically expressed in the beta cells of the pancreas, uh, and hence is an ideal marker. And what you can see is as the disease progresses, generally uh, the nature of its outlier properties uh, actually increases. So again, here's a great candidate that has to be verified by other repeated kinds of studies. One other thing that we can do is not just look at single analytes, but we can look at networks of behavior. And we've done that for this woman and demonstrated that the TNF signaling pathway is perturbed in such a way that network becomes an outlier in exactly the same way I showed you that individual analyte being an outlier. And there are reasons to think this should play a fundamental role in cancer. So we can look at each of the hierarchical levels of organization from single molecules up to uh, network behavior of biological phenomena and so forth. The last area we've looked at is to think about aging in terms of all of the data that we have. And of course, one point I would make is twins grow apart as they age. and You can see they age really differentially. And here are the, is uh, the genome, a portion of the genome of three-year-old twins showing that those different colored patterns of gene expression are virtually identical there. But when you look at 50-year-old uh, twins, these twins, you can see that there are striking differences in pattern of expression. So what this says clearly is aging is a function of, at least a, a major function, of environment and lifestyle. So what we've actually done is to look at metabolites, which is what this slide is, at proteins and clinical chemistries, all three show exactly the same thing. And we look at the pioneers in decades of 20 to 30, 30 to 40, up to uh, uh, 80 to 90, 90 to 100. And what you can say is the control of the range of metabolites expressed increases in a linear way as you age. And this has some interesting implications for how you can determine biological as opposed to chronological age. And I must say, we're at the early stages of this, and we still have more work to do. But I personally uh, think this is an incredible measure because I'm almost 80, and my biological age is 65. And what I find that does to me is, one, incentivizes me to get at least 10 years younger in the next few years. And we'll have metrics to learn how you can get younger for the first time. 
that is really going to be an exciting kind of possibility. So four key points that I'll talk about then are one, uh, preventive medicine of the 21st century. So um, we did about 10 years ago a study of mice in which we induced neurodegeneration by putting activated prions in the mice. And then we looked over the 22-week period of the progression of this disease 10 times at the level of RNA present in the brain, subtracting the diseased animals from the normal to get just the changes. And with proper manipulations, we identified 300 genes that seemed to cause the disease. We looked histologically and showed across the looking at the brain histologically revealed four different kinds of pathologic processes, prion replication and accumulation, glial activation, and two different forms of neurodegeneration. And for each of those, we had networks, and 200 of the 300 genes mapped into those four networks. And what was interesting is the networks actually became disease-perturbed at four different times across the state of progression. The other 100 genes identified six additional networks, 10 total, and together they explained all the pathophysiology of the disease. And what they de demonstrated is as time progressed, the networks became more and more complicated and more and more intertangled, interacting uh, with one another. And what this says about disease is we want to be able to get it as, as close to the earliest initiation point as possible so that we can get biomarkers at the earliest point we can measure a change and then think about reversing the disease there before it really becomes complicated at the end. And so what we can now do with human with dense dynamic personal data clouds is exactly this kind of analysis looking at the earliest transition for all chronic diseases and identify blood markers at the earliest stage, and then use the systems-driven strategies to identify therapies to reverse them. And this is exactly the preventive medicine of the future. We can actually see the transition from wellness to disease. We can get biomarkers, and we can identify targets for drug therapies, and then we can use uh, systems-driven strategies for therapies to reverse the disease at its earliest point before it's ever manifested itself as an irreversible phenotype. And if we can do this for diseases such as Alzheimer's, we can think about saving half a trillion dollars a year that we spend on Alzheimer's with the five million patients we have today. And the costs, uh, obviously, are escalating rapidly. So the applications of these data clouds are really interesting. And this brings us back to population health and how we think about it. When we have the individual data clouds, we can ask questions of the population generally in a binary fashion that will allow you to distinguish individuals within that population. For example, maybe if we said, who are the responders vs. the resp non-responders for a particular uh, clinical trial, we might see that 20% uh, uh, of the individuals were responders and the rest were non-responders. And of course, uh, we can also ask the question of off-target hits, that is toxicity, and you might get a completely different set of individuals being there or stratification of the disease through its various subtypes. So with the population, with the dense dynamic data clouds, you can ask hundreds of questions that are relevant to disease, to wellness, and to a variety of different kinds of things. And of course, uh, I think the population, again, were studying these things, one individuals, one at a time. So the data clouds let us optimize wellness. They let us follow disease response uh, to therapy, migration back to wellness. They let us look at the earliest transitions and reverse them as we've discussed, you can do N of 1 experiments that allow you to deal with the enormous complexities of nutrition and 
drug responsiveness and a variety of things like that. And of course, if you have N of 1 experiments on 20,000 individuals, you have more than enough examples to get the statistical power that you need. And the N of 1 experiments are letting us begin to think about quantifying wellness and resilience and aging, as I said before. Now, these data clouds, I think, are going to let us absolutely revolutionize how we uh, carry out clinical trials, because I think we can do it in a two-stage process where we start the clinical trial with 50 individuals, and what we look at is, one, we identify biomarkers that let us look at responders and non-responders and subtypes of disease and drug toxicity, and that puts the uh, individual pharma company in a position to say whether it wants to go on to stage two. And of course, in stage two, you use 50 individuals. All of them are responders. You'll get a 96 or 98% response rate. And that's exactly what Genentech did with her septin and got FDA approval with that high acceptance rate. So this is how drugs uh, are going to be uh, clinically analyzed in the future, and this is the essence of how P4 medicine differs from the old calculation average approach to uh, drug trials and so forth. And the reason that's important is here are the 10 top selling drugs in the US today. The orange individual is the responder. So the best response is a one in five, the worst response is a one in 25, in every case, you waste enormous amounts of money on people who won't be helped and, in fact, might be hurt by the drugs. The important point is, with the P4 approach to individual clinical trials, we'll immediately have biomarkers that will separate this individual from the non-responders and do it readily for each disease. You can never get that from average population studies that are uh, traditionally done. So the one limitation that is really enormous on the assays is, of course, their expense. And uh, right now, if we did everything we wanted to do, the expense might be three to four thousand ish a year. Or so, and we want that to drop by at least an order of magnitude in the next uh, five to ten years. And we do it by miniaturization, parallelization, automation, and integration of the various analytic assays. And I think all of this can be done with microfluidics and nanotechnology. And, and in fact, I really, I really think in 10 years, we may well have the tricorder that we can use in the home, which will punch your thumb, take a drop of blood, make 5,000 relevant measurements, ship it to the analytic center, and do exactly all the things we're doing for wellness. But you can do it real time, and you can do it as frequently uh, and, and expensively as you want. I think with the right clinical trials on scientific wellness, I'll show you one, we're going to get insurance companies to pay uh, for scientific wellness in the future because they'll save the healthcare system uh, so much money. And then finally, these digital health assays, and I'm not going to talk about, I'll talk about two of these that I think are particularly important. Doing complex phenotypes is incredibly important. One I've always been intrigued with is heart rate variability. That's what's the variation in the rate when your heart uh, actually beats. And that leads to the integration of the sympathetic parasympathetic system and all sorts of predictive powers. And I'll tell you, tell you uh, using the smartphone and what you can do with it, we can measure cognition. You can use speech to measure uh, depression, certain neurologic kinds of signs, and, and facial images can actually possibly lead to uh, assessments of health and so forth. But here's, a, again, a personal example of a simple parameter, which is pulse rate. So here is my pulse rate, uh, normally 42 to 43 here. And uh, this is a little blip as an airplane. I'll say more about that later. Where it started up here is when I had a two-week bout with the flu, which really knocked me out. One week went up to the maximum, and then the second week down to a more reasonable level here. And uh, what, um, 
And again, that other bump is an airplane. So what this allows you to do is, if you just were given this data, you couldn't say what it correlated with. But if you put it in context, it's very, very powerful for assessing individuals. Now, these two uh, airplane rides were very high altitude, long term, and they show you you aren't being very well oxygenated in airplanes. So you might want to take your Fitbit and complain. So analysis of state transitions is, I think, really important. And again, I mentioned our initial study was the static population of pioneers. But state transitions, the dynamic things, wellness to greater wellness, wellness to less wellness, wellness to disease, disease to wellness, disease progression, disease response to therapy, development, physiology, aging. And what I just want to make the point is that the approaches we can use to study these dynamical traditions are both statistics, which let you do population studies easily in these contexts, and outlier analyses, which let you look at each individual one at a time and each analyte one at a time to find the outliers. And I think these are really going to transform what we can learn about all of these state transitions because they give you a whole new approach to looking at what it means to undergo that kind of transition. So I would say there have been two big revolutions in the last 100 years plus in medicine. One occurred in 1910 with the Flexner Report. It looked at 155 trade schools and delivered a blistering report that said uh, you should bring science to the patient and science to the training of uh, uh, medical students. And Hopkins jumped on this, as did a few others. And used it over the next 40 years to become preeminent. And, and they used the science that existed in the uh, 20th century. And of course, I think the tipping point for the 21st century came when systems medicine, P4 health, and scientific wellness all came together to be 21st century medicine with the omic analyses and big data. And, and fundamentally, rather than only an interest in disease, an interest in wellness, an interest in understanding disease, and most important, in understanding and reversing wellness to disease transitions. So the CEO of uh, Providence St. Joseph's, Rod Hockman, approached me uh, early in 2015 and said, look, I'm really attracted, especially to the scientific moments idea. Why don't you let ISB become our research arm and you our chief science officer? And after consideration, we uh, agreed to do that. And Providence St. Joseph's is in seven uh, states. They have 50 hospitals, 7,500 physicians. They see 5 million patients a year. And they have uh, electronic medical records of 30 million or so. So they were an ideal context in which to bring P4 medicine into the healthcare system. And what was critical is I had a role in the C-suite that allowed me to, obvi uh, uh, to escape many of the complications of uh, a large system bureaucracy that one runs into. We created almost instantaneously a whole series of what we called translational pillars and these were clinical trials, but one, they used the data clouds, and number two, they used the uh, systems-driven technologies that opened up new dimensions of data space where they were relevant to the clinical trials. We're doing scientific wellness with 1,000 employees. They're going through three years of the Aravel program compared against 1,000 employees. We'll be able to assess increased wellness and to be able to assess uh, the economic saving. And we've already started some small Alzheimer's clinical trials using completely new approaches to Alzheimer's where I'm really confident within a three to five year period we'll be able to reverse 80% of early onset Alzheimer's. And that begins, obviously, to bring in really big saving. So we've brought P4 medicine to the healthcare system. 
We've been able to use the data clouds to assess genetics and environment. We can improve wellness. We can argue scientific wellness should be a lifetime entity. We can look at the transitions and reverse them. That, of course, leads to a lot of savings. And I think we're going to create a whole new scientific sector of scientific wellness. Uh, and I think we'll be able to transform how all the healthcare industries carry out their activities. When the price of assays come down, comes down, we'll be able to move toward dealing with the poor and the underdeveloped countries to a democratization of healthcare and scientific wellness that was really inconceivable. And it's 20th century medicine that is not going to be able to do the following. Rather, this will be what will be possible by 21st century medicine. Improving individual health, be bringing prediction and prevention through identification and reversal of transition points, enormously decreasing the costs. And finally, uh, the personal dense dynamic data clouds, I think, have transformed how we have to think about population health. Thank you. I should say, many people indicated in red here have helped with scientific wellness, including my colleague Nathan Price, who has been a spectacular partner. Okay. Okay. Um, if, 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 could, could we get people to stand up by the, by the, yeah, go ahead. Just a question. Um, you made a, a, a reference to Genentech uh, utilizing the PD3 as a, model to improve their uh, development. Can you just expand on that? It's out of curiosity. Can, can we what? Expand on the example of Genentech uh, utilizing PD3. Sure. So Herceptin is a drug for breast cancer. And what Genentech had was uh, in situ hybridization assay that could distinguish the 20% of women in the population that would respond to the drug as opposed to those that wouldn't. So they use this drug in exactly the way I described to go into a clinical trial with 46 women and they had a, I don't know, 96, 98% response rate uh, before the FDA and the FDA had no hesitation whatsoever in granting them uh, approval for the drug. So, uh, thanks very much, that was very fascinating. So, it was especially the aging that the state change uh, analysis of the, and you showed the, the chromosomes that had the different expression patterns, and then associating those with, with different analytes that would give you a, a better uh, biological prediction of age versus your actual age. And the thing that stood out to me was that there, there were twins, they're different over time, and this is, it looked like epigenetic changes that you're seeing a, a picture of on the, on the chromosomes. And so, Presume one way of getting at what are the analytes that are directly associated with aging would be the, this population approach. So taking the personal data clouds, looking across lots of people cross-sectionally, associating some of those analytes um, you know, with, with age. So another way of getting, or additional way of getting at that would be then these two twins, when they have offspring, they're going to be, there's a certain amount of that epigenetics that's going to reset, and a certain amount that won't. That's interesting in two ways. One, it's interesting because it shows you which of those things were more associated with aging, more causally associated. And the other is, what are the inherited, um, what, how are you across generations communicating your environmental exposures, which is also very important. So the, I guess the question boils down to, um, have you thought about the personal data clouds across generations and how that might be integrated? So the answer is, I've always argued that Doing scientific wellness on families gives you enormously more information about the individual than just looking at them alone sporadically. And in large part, that's because of Mendelian genetics and how much the genome has to say about wellness and disease. Now, with regard to the epigenetic comment, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, if you mean modification of chromosomes or modification of histones, that hasn't been proven at all. What they're looking at is just general gene expression. And you can change gene expression in a lot of ways other than just uh, epigenetically. But uh, changing the epigenetics is really an interesting way. Part of the problem is 
the changes really increase exponentially as you age, and you're almost certainly out of the age of childbearing by the time you see the real differences. So it might be hard to be able to follow that uh, genetically. But you know, today, there are women in their 50s that are having kids, and clearly, those two twins that were 50 had some real differences. So we may be able to do the experiments that you've suggested. Thank you.